Welcome once again to our Wednesday prayer meeting. Uh, <clears throat> just some quick announcements before we go any further. Uh, on July 19, that's the Sunday, we will have our baccalaureate Sunday. Pastor Alburn will be our speaker. So again, if you have not been able to submit the name of your graduate in your household, please do so. Uh, Wednesday is supposed to be the deadline, but, you know, try to just make it today. But if not, you know, just uh, before the end of the week, if you could, so we could prepare the names for uh, this Sunday as well. And then Discipleship Series goes on every Saturday at 4 to 5.30 p.m. And we have been having a great time as well with our online Sunday school. Please just uh, contact Sister Riza for uh, uh, details of how you can join this Sunday school or go to our previous announcements on our Sunday services so that you could get the details of how you could uh, join this online Sunday school that we're having. Uh, as we begin, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer. Thank you that this is such a precious privilege that you've given to us through the blood of your Son. When the Lord Jesus Christ finished his work on the cross, the veil was rent into two, and through him, we have been given access into your throne of grace by which we may come to you with our burdens and our cares, our anxieties, Lord God, and know that we can rest in your love and care. Father, as we uh, pray together this morning and this evening, I pray that you will just guide us with your spirit who intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered to help us pray according to your will. Thank you once again, Lord, for this awesome privilege. Bless us now. Bless the preaching of your word as we continue our study on the fruit of the Spirit. May you continue to cultivate all these virtues that come as part of the fruit of the Spirit that you are developing in us. Lord, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, sing our hymn for uh, today before we go into the message um, in our prayer meeting. Is on the 
I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Songs give place to sighing when hope within me dies. I draw. Reading now from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. By this time, perhaps many of you have already memorized this, but this is, these are good verses to memorize as you think about uh, the working of the Spirit in us. Beginning in verse 22 and then to verse 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. This is God's word. Father, we ask that you would bless our time now. Speak through your servant. Let him recede into the background. And you alone, Lord, be front and center as we go to your word this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, we've been having uh, quite a journey through just these two verses, uh, learning of the fruit of the Spirit. We have looked thus far at love, joy, peace, and long-suffering last week. Today, we will look at uh, kindness, uh, this next virtue uh, among the fruit of the Spirit, uh, kindness. Uh, in a dictionary, uh, kindness was defined as the quality or state of being gentle and considerate. Strong's, you know, in the Strong's Concordance, defines uh, kindness this way. It is taken from the Greek word, krestotes, uh, which means usefulness. Uh, it is a noun here in Galatians, which means usefulness, meaning moral excellence in character or demeanor, or gentleness and goodness and kindness. Uh, R.C. Trench describes this word Christotis as a beautiful word, he said, as it is the expression of a beautiful grace, one pervading and penetrating the whole nature, mellowing their all which would have been harsh and austere. And he goes on to say, a goodness which has no edge or no sharpness in it. 
Ray Pritchard, I love the way Ray Pritchard defines kindness. He says, kindness refers to a gracious disposition toward others. The word that is used by the Lord here in his word in Galatians 5 is the, this Christotis is the kindness, refers to the kindness that God shows to sinners. Uh, kindness, therefore, is to mirror the gracious disposition of Christ to others. Uh, disposition is a quality of character, a habit, a preparation, a state of readiness, or a tendency to act in a spe specified way that may be learned. Yeah, that's a wonderful definition. Uh, <clears throat> Stephen Whitmer, uh, Whitmer uh, puts it this way, true kindness is spirit produced according to Galatians 5.22. It is a supernaturally generous orientation of our hearts toward other people, even when they don't deserve it and don't love us in return. God himself is kind in this way. His kindness is meant to lead people to repentance, as stated in Romans 2 verse 4 which implies that they haven't yet turned to him and are still his enemies. What he's saying is, God is, is kind even to people who haven't yet turned to him and are still his enemies. Jesus spoke about this when he was exhorting uh, believers to be kind to the people who are their enemies or to the people who hate them. And this is what Jesus said, that you may be like your Father who is in heaven, who is kind uh, both to the evil and to the good, who causes his uh, rain to fall and sun to shine, even upon those who are evil and those who are, who are good. In other words, kindness is actually reflecting the graciousness of Christ to us and to others. Now, if I may say this, uh, this kindness that is being talked about, Christotis, is driven by the compassion of Christ. It is guided by Christ-like consideration. And it is characterized by Christ-like action. Once again, if kindness is reflecting the graciousness of Christ to others, then it is a kindness that is driven by Christ-like compassion, guided by Christ-like consideration, and uh, manifested or characterized by Christ-like action. So this morning, we'd like to, to kind of look at three aspects of what this kindness that the Holy Spirit is seeking to develop in every child of God. This kindness is, number one, we will find today, a grace-driven compassion, a grace-filled consideration, and a grace-empowered action. Because if it's reflecting Christ, then it is a virtue that finds its root in the grace of God. So first of all, kindness is a grace-driven compassion. You know, we see this in the life of the Lord Jesus, who, when he was being crucified, he said, Father, to the very, uh, he, he prayed for the very people that were hurting him. He said to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> I don't know how that must have impacted even the thieves who were crucified with him. But the thieves certainly heard this as they were being crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is said that people, when they were being crucified, some of them would curse, some of them would yell out in anger in order to deaden the pain, that tremendous physical pain that they were being subjected to 
at that moment of their crucifixion. But they, there, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, was grace-driven compassion, even upon the very people who were killing him at that moment. As he cries out to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, the, the, the thieves on the cross make for a very interesting study. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 44, we read that even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. What that means is, as people were seeing Jesus crucified, people were mocking him, people were reviling him, people were ridiculing him. And the Bible says both those two thieves were themselves reviling Jesus the way the crowd that were witnessing his crucifixion, the way they were doing it to Christ. But of course we read in Luke, Luke 23, verse 39 to 43, that as this was going on, as one of the thieves was witnessing what was happening to Christ, what the people were doing to Jesus, and Jesus' prayer to the Father, and how, how the love of God glowed through the life of Christ, even in this moment of unimaginable pain and terror, the Spirit began to work in the heart of one of the thieves. So that we read in Luke 23, 39 to 43, it says here, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, you know, one of the thieves said, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, yeah, answering, rebuked him. See the change there. Saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is what kindness looks like. It is a grace-driven compassion. As we have seen portrayed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you pray the same to the people who may be hurting you today? Would you let the Holy Spirit nurture in you this same kind of grace-driven compassion for others? Secondly, kindness is grace-filled consideration. You know, it is... It is uh, that the way we think about others is filled with God's grace. That it is we, we, how we think. It's not just what we desire for others is driven by grace. But we begin to, when the Holy Spirit begins to work in you, to develop kindness in you, you begin to look at people through the eyes of the Lord through the glasses of grace, so to speak, because kindness is grace-filled consideration. Psalm 103, verse 8 to 10 says this, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. And I love this in verse 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Grace-filled consideration. Psalm 103 verse 14 says this, For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Kindness then is the result of the believer growing in the mind of Christ as the Spirit 
works in him to develop this fruit in his life. You know, we, we remember the words of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to verse 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. See, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Grace-filled consideration. The mind of Christ, it was a serving mind. It was a sacrificial mind. It was a selfless mind. It was a humble mind. It was an obedient mind. Thirdly, kindness is not only grace-driven compassion, grace-driven consideration, but it is also grace-empowered action. You know, we were studying long-suffering last week, and uh, long-suffering is kind of more like a passive trait, where we said it is the uh, spirit-empowered ability to bear long and well uh, with people and with circumstances for the glory and the purpose of Christ. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a passive trait, uh, meaning like it was a response to, to what people would do to you and to the circumstances around you. But kindness is more active in its nature. It is intentional. It is a love that takes initiative. It doesn't wait to be acted upon, but it acts out of a heart that's driven by the compassion of Christ, by the mind of Christ. It is grace-empowered, characterized by grace-empowered action. Kindness, you know, in, in, stating it another way, is reflecting then, is, is reflecting then the gracious compassion, consideration, and action of Christ to others. To be kind is to have a gracious heart to others, to think graciously of others, and to act graciously to others. And if grace is undeserved favor from God in relation to our relationship with Him, kindness then means that we desire good, we think good, and we do good to even those people who we feel don't deserve it. It's easy to be good to the people that you like, but we're learning that kindness is to learn to do good, to desire good, to think good, even to people who we feel don't deserve it. That is hard to do. That is not our nature. It is a supernatural trait. I agree with Stephen Whitmer when he said, it can only be produced by the working of the Spirit in us. It is indeed a fruit of the Spirit. Why would the Lord want to develop this virtue in His children? Because... It is through reflecting the gracious disposition of Christ to others that we grow as His instruments of bringing people to Himself. And I mentioned this earlier. Jesus said in Luke 6 verse 35, But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. I love that, right? And your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High. Listen to this. For He is kind to the unthankful and evil. <laughs> you know, when we do good to people and they're not thankful, we say, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that to you again. That's the last time. And you know, our God is such. Our God is so gracious. 
and so kind that He continues to show His kindness to the unthankful and evil for adventure that the goodness of God will lead them to repentance. In an article, again, written by Stephen Whitmer, he was talking about the grace of God at work in the life of Rosaria Butterfield. Some of you may have read about her, but let me read a portion of that article to you. In her, in her memoir about the journey from being a committed lesbian to a committed Christian, Rosaria Butterfield says that as a non-Christian, her impression of evangelical Christians was that they were poor thinkers, judgmental, scornful, and afraid of diversity. After publishing a critique of an evangelical Christian group in her local newspaper, she received an enormous volume of polarized responses. Placing an empty box in each corner of her desk, she sorted hate mail into one and fan mail into the other. Then she received a two-page response from a local pastor. And she said, it was a kind and inquiring letter. It had a warmth and civility to it, in addition to its probing questions. It was said in such a way that she said she couldn't figure out which box to put the letter in. She couldn't figure out because of its uh, honesty whether to put it into the hate mail, uh, but, but then because of the tenderness of its tone, whether to put it in the fan mail because she couldn't put it in the fan mail because it was opposed to her, to her views in life. So it sat on her desk for seven days. But this is what, this is what Rosaria, Rosaria Butterfield said. It was the kindest letter of opposition that I had ever received. Its tone demonstrated that the writer wasn't against her. Even though, if I may say, that the writer was obviously against what she held as her worldview. Eventually, Stephen Whitmer said, she contacted the pastor and became friends with him and his wife. And she said, they talked to me in a way that didn't make me feel erased. Their friendship was an important part of her journey to faith. Today, Rosaria Butterfield is a vibrant Christian, married to a pastor. She actually became a pastor's wife. And what God used, among the many things perhaps that God used, in her journey of faith in Christ was the kindness of a local pastor and his wife. Kindness is doing good to others even when it's hard because our hearts desire their welfare. Mind you that it is not kindness when your doctor doesn't tell you you have cancer because he doesn't want to hurt your feelings or devastate you. But a good doctor will tell you that bad news so you can begin seeking treatment for your sickness. That's why Jesus confronted people with their sins because only then they would see their need for a Savior. Sometimes kindness, kindness and niceness really don't mean the same. But you see, the gospel is not good news unless people see first the bad news of their sins. I am sure that in Rosaria's life, times with her Christian friends, there were probably times 
that she spent with them where they shared the painful truth to her until she finally fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit until she finally repented and gave her heart over to the Lord. But the truth was shared to her in kindness. Grace-driven compassion, grace-filled consideration, and grace-empowered action. How can this virtue be important to us in our current situation like right now? In this time of so many adjustments, this is a time to help one another get through it, through being kind, through expressing this, uh, the kindness of Christ to each other. In these days, in these difficult days and challenging days, we have the opportunity to, to reflect the gracious disposition of Christ to each other and others around us. I know that we are praying for God to end this pandemic. And He will in His own time and his, in His own plan. But I'm thinking, maybe as we pray that, that we should also pray, Lord, through this pandemic, give us grace to give glory to You by reflecting your kindness, by reflecting your grace to each other and to others around us. May we say to him, Lord, how do you want to develop the fruit of kindness in our lives? We will cooperate. We will submit to you. Oh Lord, let our lives produce that fruit for your glory. May we mirror the grace-driven compassion, the grace-filled consideration, the grace-empowered action of the Lord Jesus Christ to each other and to others around us. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Fill us constantly with your spirit that more and more your love, your joy, your peace, and your long-suffering and your kindness may become more evident. Thank you for what we're learning as we continue our journey through each of these aspects of the fruit of the spirit. May we understand what it means to be more like Jesus. Shine, O Lord, through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us in our prayer meeting uh, today. Uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, next week, um, next Wednesday. God bless you. Have a good and godly day.